This is Rick, host of Yachting USA, produced by Yachting International Radio. And tonight we are at Bradford Marine and I'm sitting with Captain Wendy Clark. This has been a much looked forward to conversation. Wendy, yes. thanks for joining the show. Hey. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for putting in all the legwork that goes up to something like this. So oh, it's, it's pleasure. nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Magic. Behind, magic. The, behind the scenes magic. It's, yeah, Ray is behind the scenes. That's the magic she happens. Is. No, this is good stuff. I think you are my 34th uh, episode, which yeah. is kind of cool. We're really starting to move it along. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I'm glad we're sitting here in the South Florida summer evening. It's a little warm. We're on the heart. The air conditioning is yes. turned off. So we're on deck at Bradford Marine. Wonderful facility. Bradford's got a lot of, a lot of infrastructure uh, investment going on. Uh, lovely shipyard, lovely group of people that are running the shipyard. So it's serendipity in a way that we happen to be here. Yeah. And you're here for some service work on, tell, yes. tell me about the boat real quick before uh, we get into We are things. on our 88 foot sun seeker. She was, her name is Splashed Out, Red Hull. She came to us about two and a half years ago. So she's been under our TLC since then. Just standard, standard out of water maintenance. Stuff that has to happen. Stuff, stuff that has to happen, but you need it out of the water to get yeah, there. So I get it. Standard, I get it. Standard. Good. Yeah. Well, you're in a good place. Yeah. This is my second time with Bradford. Okay. Came to them as orphans of the Rossioli buyout. So originally we were patrons of Rossioli. Right on. And so when the gentle takeover happened, we were absorbed and great experience yeah. with them. You, you mentioned me earlier, you came then. because of the people. Yes, I did come because of the people. The project manager that I absolutely adore, shout out to Dan Kingston, a staple in the industry and here at these yards. He came to Bradford from Rossioli. And honestly, he's why I stayed coming down here. Love so it, I love it. Well, yeah. and hopefully the experience you're having here is going to resonate and bring you back in the future again. Yeah. Yeah. It's about relationships. It is. It's, it's about the people and, you know, you can build the best infrastructure you want, but if you don't have the right people in place, it doesn't matter. Correct. So yes. Yeah. Good stuff. But really, I want to talk about you a little bit here, Wendy, because you have an interesting story. Um, Southern California girl. I am. You, yes. I mean, we were talking at dinner earlier. You didn't really see this coming initially. I didn't, Being no. captain <laughs> of, of a charter vessel and uh, being in this industry the way you are. So, love to hear a little bit more about what it was like growing up in Southern California. You went down a path, went to school, and had ambition to go a completely different direction for a while. I did. This is my maritime career has been a series of delightful accidents. So, I had originally planned on being an academic for right. most of my life. And I took classes at community college. I kind of fell into their level one Mariner certification at Orange Coast College. It's in Southern California. And kind of just continued to have happy accidents. I graduated from their program with a certification that kind of just let you know kind of the basics about how to tell your ass from your elbow. That's and, important. Yeah, and how not to die on deck. And that was kind really of really important. The the basics there. Right. And happened to be talking to an instructor at about the time I was looking to move into a deck hand position. He had a contact with an owner that was looking for crew and went to the interview, ended up working on that vessel for about six and a half years while I continued my academic cool. career. You, you, you were gonna be a weather girl. I was not. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> that is the big question, though, when I talk about how I was really interested in meteorology and weather science and climate science and all that, that the first question is weather girl, yes. But I figured that, honestly, being a weather girl is a thankless job because it's your forecasts are really only good for a few hours, up to a day, maybe two. And then after that, it's one of the few swag. professions where you can basically screw up every day at work and, and still keep going, and keep your job. Keep your paycheck and show up the next day with a smile and do it all over uh, again. So would it surprise you if I told you, you know, uh, you know, we're avid divers, my son and yes. I, and uh, we're in the ocean a lot. And this summer we were in uh, the Bahamas for a couple of weeks and we do a lot of diving off the coast here. And I was checking my computer and checking temperatures and surface temperature right offshore in the last few weeks is running about 
85, 86 degrees. Warm. And when we dropped down to about 70 feet of water, it was 84 degrees. Ooh. Oh, yeah. So that's a pretty significant water column with a lot of energy in it. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, now, that's a little foreboding for yeah. our coming peak of storm <laughs> season here. That's, that's it's not, not a good always thing like to hear. that. I've, I've, been, I've been out there in, in July and, and dropped down on a 40, 50 meter wreck, and there's been a cold water upwelling, and I'm nice and warm in decompression in the first, you know, 40, 50 feet of water, but down there it was dropping down to, you know, 55, 60 yeah. degrees. Yeah. So, and you're not normally wearing a dry suit in the summertime. So, no. you know, you kind of have to suck that not out, up a little not bit. Not out here. No. But weather. You, so, yeah. so that's a real thing. And you were it going is. down that path. It's a real thing. Yeah. And I had PhD plans and goals. Got accepted to UCLA in, as a PhD student. Awesome. And about a year into the program, realized that my passion for science in the field and that kind of data gathering and kind of being immersed in the environment where you're getting that data from so that you have a better chance of recognizing patterns or seeing changes and that kind of stuff that you don't necessarily just get from raw data. And unfortunately, the field that I had a passion for had shifted from the field work to computer modeling. And I learned very quickly that I am a terrible coder, (laughs) 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 absolutely terrible at it, and didn't have a passion for it. And if you're going to have a PhD in something this big, you need to have a passion for it. And I was lacking that. So uh, about a year into the program, I kind of had to come to terms with that, realized that it was time for a change and sat down with my advisor and my mentor and we saw that I could just basically sign a piece of paper and leave with my master's. So, Bravo. so that's what I did. Yeah. It was a lot of work. I didn't want to be that, you know, six, eight, 10 year PhD plan student. So I really buckled down in that first year. And so I completed, we... completed a master's in a, in a year, that's strong. Um, which honestly surprised me myself too i had i did not expect that I guess at all your so advisors nice. were a little surprised too they were everybody was like oh, oh <laughs> yeah just sign this paper i guess you're good see you never see you never <laughs> and so yeah then it was a moment of where i really had to look because my my life plan the job that i had been building all these steps to was now no longer an end goal for me and I was like well i've really enjoyed my time as a deckhand and working on the charter boat that I had stayed Did, on. You had your STCW through that program by then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the Mariner program at Orange Coast College, they do STCW. They do basic boat handling. They do basic maintenance, everything from like oil checks to varnish. Right. Uh, basically, you get your hands on a little bit of everything at the most entry level and, version of it. And fast forward real quick. You're here now. You're out of the water at Bradford. You get work yes. done. You are also back in school, right? I am. <laughs> See? Yes. It's a never ending cycle. <laughs> it's, it's never ending. <laughs> never but as it should be, right? As it should be. Yeah. My first training captain, Bob McCoy, said, you learn the best if you are a little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, that is where the sweet spot is for learning. And so if you Almost get anything two, worthwhile, Wendy, yeah. really. Yeah. So, you know, it, I've had my 200 ton ocean for about four years now. It's time to take that next step. You know, at least do the classes, take the test, earn that next license for 500, maybe 1600. I have to sit down with the lovely beings over at MPT and have <laughs> them help me figure out life as it pertains specifically to Coast Guard regulations. Fantastic. So I didn't mean to step ahead, but I, I didn't want to miss this opportunity to kind of plug the idea that, you know, as a yachting professional, we all have to keep educating ourselves. You know, if, you're, if you are, you know, an at sea professional, you know, a mariner, yeah, you've got specific things. You've got to, your tickets got to be maintained. You're, mm-hmm. There's classes you have to take. And, and as you step up in larger boats, it, it just gets more incrementally complex, definitely uh, challenging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Worthwhile, though, I think. Very worthwhile. Yeah. I, I think so. Um, Even the rest of us that are in this industry, I, I, I tell anybody, never stop learning. You know, it's, there's so many facets to this industry, and, so and you can't be expert in all of them. You should be knowledgeable in most of them, and always stretch a little bit. Try to, try to get a little bit further than you were before. 
Yeah. 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 Because you never know what opens up after that or no. who you can help along it, after you. And, and all it's, that. it's interesting. And we'll talk about that too. I think that's important how you can, in this industry, really do well for others, mentor other people, and help other people progress. Is, you know, that's, that's it is good. our industry in general, but especially the vessel side of it, the crew side of it is right. still very apprentice based. Like, Coast Guard counts on your captain and your head of department on deck to teach you things. That's right. Because our tests are not, at least in this country still, are not practical tests. They are all theoretical. They're all, right. you have and, to and sit somewhere and take a paper test. And they, the entity of the Coast Guard is banking on the fact that you worked with people that are passing down their working knowledge that's how it works of the profession in the Coast Guard, in the Navy, you know, that, that, that trickle down effect. It's real. You, you know, when you're it at is. sea, that's the classroom. Yeah. That's a real classroom. You know, there's so many, there's, it's so multidimensional, so many things going on. So, so you kind of fell out of the academic, left the academic left piece and, and joined the wonderful world of yachting. I did. Yes. And tell me about that. Now you jumped on board as a deck. So my first job, I was lucky to be with um, a really incredible training captain and charter program right out of the gate. I think the vessel is actually still chartering in Southern California. It's called the Paradiso. She's out of Newport Harbor, Newport, right. Newport Beach. Yeah. And uh, yeah, zero stripe deckhand. <laughs> Worked my way up. Like, straight from the bottom. Yeah, straight from the bottom. I came in and cleaned the boat after a first couple charters. I wasn't even on a charter. I wasn't even on the charter for the charter boat. No, chip share no on that one. not none of it at all. In fact, I was just I came in and cleaned. But honestly, I think it was a really fantastic way to get to know the vessel. And I didn't know Absolutely. it at the time. I'm sure Bob did because he's a fantastic captain in person in general and a fantastic teacher right. and mentor. Not everybody is born to be a teacher and a mentor. I was True. very lucky um, to have Bob because he was, is, he's not dead. He's still alive and yeah. doing great. Stay with us, Bob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we still need you. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, I still call Bob when yeah. I have moments of, of panic, even as a, a captain and under my own license. It's still nice to have those contacts and yes. make those calls. No, it's just... But yeah, so I just... I came and cleaned the boat and that was a great way to get to know it because I'd never worked. I'd never worked on a boat before, period. Hard stop. Wow. Um, so it was a really great way to get to know it. In fact, I was like cleaning a window and was like, that is such a weird print to be cleaning off a window. And you just kind of sit back and you're like, oh, those are... okay, <laughs> I'll just keep cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go wash my hands next, but I'll, oh, I'll gosh. keep cleaning. <laughs> hmm. Epiphany. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see some anatomy left yeah. over there. All right, then. Well, uh, charter boat. Welcome to chartering, folks. Oh, uh, the stories we could tell. Exactly. Uh, tell so, us. yeah, and just worked my way up about six and a half years on the same boat doing summers and kind of like holiday stuff. Right. We are, we don't have the nice inland water out there like we do here. So when it gets a little rough in the Pacific, we don't, don't go out. Out. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a different world over there. It is. I know there's so much water over there. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but you can only access it occasionally. <laughs> that's all. I mean, you don't have to be on a boat to access it. Anyway, you can take the girl out of California, but you can't take California out of the girl. No, don't do that. So, yeah, I'm sorry. We're just a little bit of ramble there. But no, that stuff. was the that was the progression. It was just I thought that working on a boat as a deckhand would give me a good upper hand as a science intern. And those two paths were parallel up until the moment I decided that I wasn't going to be in academia anymore. So yeah. when I left that, I did have this whole career to not necessarily fall back on, but to step into. Yes. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. So at some point in time, I'd love to introduce you to a couple of ladies I've gotten to know real well through the Sea Keeper Society. I'd love that. Um, Katie Sheehan and Aubrey Keith, they are... Like you, they academics that went down that path that also went into the maritime world and now are killing it, doing science support with the International Seakeeper Society. And, you know, they're out on my boat occasionally, one of the smallest discovery vessels in the Seakeeper <laughs> fleet. But we have a lot of time, good time with it. And, yeah. and we do citizen science work. And, nice. you know, it's a good it's way. Come One of the ways I'd like to give back a little bit with my resources is yeah. to provide the infrastructure, the opportunity to get on the water. Some of these 
professors and grad students don't have that easily or yeah. it's expensive. So, yeah, you know, it you is expensive. Do something to help out. It's good. But those girls have really done something pretty cool. And I think you, you and them would probably kick it up for a while. Um, <laughs> Science nerds. Yeah, there you go. So charter, you're working and living in the charter world. That's different than running a private vessel. It's frankly, probably on some levels, a lot more work. Talk to me what you, you know, and in full disclosure, Wendy's here in South Florida, but you actually run your charters out of an area I grew up in, the Tampa Bay area. Tampa, yes. Yes, yes that's Tampa my Bay. stomping grounds. That's where I grew up. And so I know the area real well. Beautiful Great. bays, tributaries, rivers, yeah. out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Egmont Key. Yep. Um, that's one of our top destinations for our eight-hour charters is out to Egmont for a water day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go on the clothing optional side or... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no, we stay on the state park side. <laughs> All right, there you go. So, what's it like for you? Um, that's a different charter world over there than it is over here in South Florida or the Bahamas, no question about it. Uh, that is definitely what I've heard. Unfortunately, I don't know this area to compare and contrast very well. But yeah, the West Central Coast is growing. Uh, I think that. Some of our smaller marinas, the areas that are a little more nature focused are drawing a new breed of yacht charter okay. to the area. Almost like eco charter in some ways? Um, a little bit, but it, we still have the luxury platform for it. So it's the people that like the idea of luxury, but don't necessarily need the show off get a version of it they like to have the service they like to have the space they like the attentive crew but they don't need to be med moored against see and be 30, seen kind 30 of thing. other vessels right. yeah. they, they like the fact that when they go when they decide to go to bed at night they're not fighting the parties that are going on either side if they have kids, they don't have to worry about the parties that are going on either side, side. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's not just below deck, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it? For our company, it's all above deck and the crew just sits there and goes, uh, yes. Good, good. But yeah, no, so it's the marinas that we go to are smaller. Yeah. So when we are there, you do have the feeling that you are the biggest yacht. You are the biggest boat in that marina. All right, kind of stand up um, a little bit. Yeah, so you, you can still get that status sure that that's stated real. without having to elbow your way right. off on and off the boat in the marina but you were mentioning something which i'm very aware of but a lot of people aren't that you know these are absolutely not nine to five days these are you know when you're on charter you know you're putting in 16 18 hour days and, and, and getting right back up the next day to do it again for yes. maybe two three weeks depends on the charter depends yeah. on the circumstances but it goes yeah, that is one of the ways that currently West Central Florida is a little different is that we don't have these long charters like you guys do out here. Still in the Bay, the bread and butter is still really the day cruises, the four hours with water time in the Bay, the eight hours where we can get water time out at Amont Key. Maybe there's an overnight or two, but we tend to marina hop, like we'll go down the ICW, spend a night at sarasota keep going spend a night down in venice or boca grand someplace right. where you can then explore we don't we're large vessels for our area but in this in the scheme of large boats we're really not that big so we don't sit well on anchor sure we don't you're better off tied to the dock. yeah we don't go long distances quickly or steadily you know we still bob around like a cork if the gulf is being a little snotty right so in order to curate the best experience for our clients we tend to stay intercoastal you get to see things instead of Emotion. just you know the person that you decided to get on the boat with and you just twiddle your thumbs and stare at each other <laughs> is it over yet is, are, is we it over yet? Yet? <laughs> are we there yet are we there yet so it's it's a very different experience than what down here in South Florida offers. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty familiar with the charter experiences here in the Bahamas, Caribbean and all that. And it's, yeah, those are definitely, you know, one or multiple week outings. And, definitely. Yeah. Because it takes you that long to get to the destination. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the idea of those charters is to, you know, be out in the middle of 
nowhere on anchor and just the time it would take for us to leave our dock in downtown Tampa and even try to replicate that. Right. You spend so much time just trapped on the boat. It's a nice boat and it might even be with people you like, but even Let's people, so. I know, right? <laughs> but you know, even that experience tends, then you're just in a moving living room yeah, where yeah. It, instead of experiencing being the on, a, on a yacht. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and being on the ocean and around exactly. the you know, yeah, outside what, what we all like to be part of when mm -hmm. we're away from the dock. Exactly. So you have this boat, but there's three boats in your program, right? Two and a half. Two and a half, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have this 88-footer. We also have an 83-footer, uh, also Sunseeker, Manhattan. She's called Vanguard. Okay. She was actually the first vessel right. to kind of start this She was the Vanguard chaos. Of the fleet. Yes, yes, she is. So I started working on her in 2020. Okay. And then a year and a bit later, we got the 88-footer. And then... A year and a bit later, we got a 55 foot marquee. See, right. Carver marquee. Carver. Yes, yeah. Carver. Yeah. And that one is going through all of the hoops and iterations that will get her as an inspected vessel because she's too small to run as a UPV 12 pack, which is what we run the two big boats on. Right, right. And our area is flooded with that size range so I know it. of <laughs> yeah. of bare boat charters. So in order to kind of set ourselves apart and still have a vessel of that size was the inspected route. That makes sense. Makes so purpose. that has been trial and tribulation. And also one of the reasons why I bring the big boats down here for yard periods is just our yard situation is really hit or miss on the west coast and it just it comes down to people yeah really like we, you can we, have a great we, facility and a great yard manager and things go smoothly but as soon as one of those things falls yeah. out of sync it's well uh, and if we just look, look around this yard and this yard replicates itself down the river yeah this size vessel is very predominant here so yes. so there's a lot of there's a lot of legacy knowledge and capabilities for servicing and, and refitting and, and providing infrastructure for these boats. Here. Yeah, the vendor pool is here. Yep. Like where we are, there's maybe one or two vendors. And there's definitely, and if there are two, there's definitely one that does a better job than the other, you know? And so to get the support right. to work on something right. this size is before, it's just not there. No, and no. it just makes more sense for us to bring. I would love to see that change. I don't have the money to make that change. Uh, so, I would be somebody's biggest cheerleader. Well, you know, they you know, so you never know. There's so many people that are watching this podcast because we're about the business of yachting. Yeah. There might be somebody out there listening to you right now going, hmm, there's an opportunity. There is attention to that. There is a solid opportunity, a bigger travel lift, anything like. I have to bring the 88 footer here. Right. The 83 footer can get lifted at two local places, but in order to get to them, the channel's really shallow. I hit bottom every time I go in and out of there. Yeah, I don't do that. And I'm like, well, there just goes the paint yeah. job. We just <sighs> spent thousands yeah. of dollars or, or on. So balancing the props or something like that. Right. So, <laughs> and, and it's I all guess, soft, no, which is yeah, nice, yeah. but oh. Tampa ship's a little too big. So, you know, right. And they're not set up for yacht finishes. They are very commercial. Mm -hmm. As you see around here, everybody's tented. Everything's clean. We are still a very industrial port. Yeah, yeah. And so you get the shade cloth that meet regulations, but don't necessarily go that step beyond to keep it yacht Pristine. clean. Yeah, I get and you. so, yeah, not only are we, so we're too small for those guys. Yep. <laughs> and too big. For the regular You're yards. Right. right. And yeah, the commercial stuff is, it's, just very messy still. I, if I needed to go there for an emergency, hands down, I would. They have fantastic craftsmen over there. Yep. But yeah, I would. Yeah. I'd have to tape blue diamond on everything and shrink wrap everything. everything yeah. Just because of the. You have to, right? Yeah. The just the industrial flotsam yeah. and jetsam. <laughs> absolutely true. So Wendy, I have to 
going to take us down another rabbit hole. I, I do this on the heels of an interview I did last week, um, which was really insightful, I think. Professional women in yachting. Yeah, professional women in yachting, yes. I watched it. It was a did fantastic you? interview. Samantha is a wonderful lady, and I love their comment about, you know, she formed that organization because she was angry. Out of anger. Out of I anger. I felt that. I was like, I feel that. So, Miss Moore, I there you, you go. See, you are having you. an effect. I hear you. And so, listen, I, I acknowledge I've been in this business, well, for almost 40 years. And, and before this, I was in the commercial offshore oil field industry for four and a half years. And I know that it's a very male-dominated, at times misogynistic industry. And yet, I can attest to the fact that some of the most amazingly professional, competent, and qualified yacht captains I've had the pleasure to do business with, it's, it's a thing. It's, you know, the, so I guess I'm sitting here as an uh, older guy saying, you know, talk to us about these challenges. How do we do better as an industry? What have, what's been your experience coming up as a woman in yachting, having um, to deal with these realities? Because they're real. So. As I said kind of earlier, my career here has been a series of quite happy accidents. So happy accidents. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's always that underlying as a female in this industry, you work harder, you work better. Your work has to be unimpeachable, untarnishable, all of that. And you have to put in all of that work just to stand shoulder to shoulder with some 17 year old kid who's just been driving a center console and going fishing with his dad since he was five and doesn't have the same knowledge base, doesn't have the same experience, just steps in on deck next to you. And the captain is just like, well, you're obviously equals and you're like, oh, no, I uh, know <laughs> we on. are, we are not. <laughs> wow. So number one, you have to say, we'll be willing to stand up for yourself. You do. Yeah. And you have to have a thick skin and it's not, I have been very lucky now that I've been in contact with Rhea and have seen just other females tell their stories and some of these other podcasts where they talk about situations that are legitimately dangerous right. for female crew. I have yes. Like that would, absolutely. I have not experienced it in that way and I'm thankful well for that. I am as well as a yachting <laughs> professional and and maybe I can point to that saying maybe there's hope. I do think that there's hope and I know that there is a strong emphasis and focus on what is wrong currently because that's how you that's how you get eyes on it. Mm -hmm. And if you get eyes on it, then you get people behind it. And if you get people behind it, then you get momentum and momentum is how you change things. That's right. So I get that personally, though, that has not been my path. So here to support, but I can't, I can't add my experience right. to the bucket right. on that one. Or, but or your experience is just a different experience. It you is. do add to the bucket. It's, it's a different experience. Right. So I had fantastic training captains both um, Captain Bob and Captain Craig, who came after Bob. And I was in a position where I was able to work side by side with the male crew and learn things and advance like them and with them. And I wasn't held back just because I was or small or <laughs> you right. know something like that. Yeah. I did make very specific choices as a young deck person i did not take interior jobs i didn't mind doing chores right for to keep the interior clean because we were also on a small boat 84 feet something like that so yep. everybody did everything even the captains would help clean so i'm not saying that i did i would never touch an interior because that's not true. But I would say thank you, but no thank you to stew positions. You had purpose and intention I to did. stay deck and to move stay in that deck direction. Because it was very easy. And it's even easy now, just as a female and especially a small female, it's very easy to be pigeonholed into the interior mm -hmm. space. Yep. And I tried to make very conscious decisions 
to prove myself on deck. Bravo. It paid off, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so far, no, so I, I think it has. But also knowing that everybody does everything on these small boats, I feel like I had a very well-rounded foundation, especially for the position that I have now and the kind yeah. of charters that we run now and that I have to oversee both departments. So I know what the standard is for interior. I know what the standard is for deck. I know what the standard is for our service and our maintenance and all of that. So it was a, a focused path right. that at times were definitely more difficult because as I stood shoulder to shoulder with the boys on the team. Yeah. Their they, shoulders were a little higher than yours. Oh, every, everybody's <laughs> are. <laughs> everybody's shoulders are higher than mine. But it did not make them more capable. It, just, it did not. Yeah. No, but yeah, it does really fall back to, I think that the, the reason why when you work with female captains is that we, we've, we've had to be more professional. We've had to work harder. We've had to learn more. <laughs> no, I get it. In order to stay in this industry and be marketable and competitive and all of those things, mm -hmm. because I still like I am the only female in a 20 person class over at MPT right now that's doing the master mate 500, 1600 upgrade stuff. Right, right. So it's just, it's still there. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if in the like broadest scheme of things it will change a lot we're making small changes mm -hmm. but i don't know like I, I said to you in our kind of it pre-interview stuff i'm not here to bust down any ceilings or kick down any doors i like what i do right, right. and i'm going to continue to work at the level that i right. work at in whatever job or yeah. position or crew that i have and if it makes a change awesome right but it's not my intention. There are some people in this world where they wake up every morning and it's their intention to change the world around them. I unfortunately was, I was never, I wasn't even born with that kind <laughs> of drive. I was like, I like to wake up and do my job and then we'll see what happens the next day. That's perfect. And we just That's kind perfect. of move on and we just yeah. roll through life that way. But you know, I only bring it up because I think this is an industry where we want to at least be aware of some of these challenges and help make good decisions and make call good out, decisions. Yeah, <laughs> make good decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And call out the bad behaviors when we see it and yeah. be willing to, you know, uh, in some ways level the playing field because there's, there's a lot of talented people coming into this industry. And we want to promote these Definitely. individuals, men and women, All to do well and to excel, which is a good segue into. If you're talking to what we call greenies in this industry, what, what would your message be? Um, it's going to be a little harsh, greenies. Uh, lower your expectations. Okay. Like you need to start at the bottom. The people that you see working on the big yachts and, you know, working their way up through the deck situation We've all started at the bottom. Yes. You have to start there too. And I understand that Bravo makes everything look shiny and green and exciting. That is well edited. <laughs> <laughs> it yes. is very well edited. And to walk in to any job, really, not just our industry, but to walk into any job and just say, you owe me what I expect is an unrealistic way to go through life yeah, no, <laughs> in that's, general. That's totally true. Totally true. Um, so my favorite greenies are, and it doesn't matter how green you are, even if you're just like green to our program, my favorite greenies are the ones that will, for the first month, just listen, do what they're told and ask questions to help identify the holes in their knowledge. So the fastest way <laughs> to get under a head of department skin or your captain's skin is to walk on a boat and they have you do something a specific way. They go through the steps with you. They have the patience to teach you 
how they want this particular thing done on sure. their vessel, you need to do it that way. The moment you're like, well, on my last boat. I know better. Nobody wants to hear that. Every vessel does things differently. Yeah. There might be some things that are similar, but if there's a program that we're using, if there's a cleaning product that we're using, if there are certain steps that I want you to do to prep before you use the specific cleaning product, it's because we've been doing it for four, three, three, four, five years, and we have found that's the way to do it. Right. Like it gives you the best finish. It saves you the most time. It protects the stuff around you for when you inevitably kick over the, yes, <laughs> the yeah. stuff that you're working, the chemical that you're working with. Right, right. So I think my best advice to the greenies is learn from your environment. Even if you've had classes the first time you are on a vessel, I don't care if it's your first vessel or your 50th vessel, the first time you are on that vessel, you watch and you listen and you learn. Bravo. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's been a few interesting conversations lately. The Marine Industries Association of South Florida, I said that without having to stumble on it, M-I-A-S-F, <laughs> has brought out and is endorsing a really cool apprenticeship program here in South Florida. In my tenure in this industry, I've watched how apprenticeship programs have worked in Europe remarkably well, in Asia remarkably well. And I've always lamented that there really weren't good apprenticeship programs here. Mm -mm. This is coming from a guy that, you know, had a very successful manufacturing company for 35 years, hiring lots and lots of talented craftsmen to do the work and realizing that there were no good programs to prep the young people coming out of high school and in their first levels of adulting, so to speak. How to, Zero stars. Do zero, not exactly. You know, how to show up and be successful and take on a trade and doing all that. So from your perspective, you see that as kind of important, too, I think. I do. I think it's very important. And because we don't have that scaffolding in place, we literally just say, go take your SCCW and then go dock walk. Good luck. Yeah. And good luck. Good luck. Just good luck. See you when we see you. And that's, I don't know, I, it's really disheartening for the people who have a passion for it. Right. It does tend to weed out the weak, <laughs> which unfortunately, with as shiny and pretty as this industry is from the outside, in order to make it look smooth and shiny and fingerprint free, there's a lot of work and man hours and dedication that goes into everything behind the scenes. No question. And so in that respect, kind of weeding out the week kind of quickly, I think is a benefit. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. It's, it is quite the barrier to entry for our industry. And I think that is really is what's keeping us from growing and getting the talent that we need and feeling like you, like, as a captain, feeling like you want to put the energy into these people because they're going to stay and they're going to make something of themselves and they're right. going to go places. And when you just have greeny after greeny and you've taught the same four steps to 15 different people because they're just rotating on and off your boat, that takes the wind out of our sails at the same time. And just because you just get so tired, it's like you have we have our jobs to do first yeah. and foremost. And although part of that is mentoring, we take, like whenever I have a new crew member on board, not only am I doing my 40 plus hours, right. hours a week, I'm now taking daytime out of my life to make sure that this person gets the safety training that they need and just the general training. So not only do I still have to do my work, but I've got those eight hours or, you know, four to eight hours a day of training a new person, which right. I luckily I get to share with my staff captain, Christian, who's a fantastic mentor and a good trainer. And he's kids going places for sure. He's um, very talented and he cares, That's um, which is fantastic. And so luckily I've been able to share some of that duty with him, but until he was, he felt confident enough to step into that mentor role. I was, I did 40 hours a week with my newbie and still had to figure out 
where to jam my 50, 60 hours a week to make sure that I didn't drop the ball and stuff that I was doing. So a lot of responsibility there. It's, it is a lot. And I think that's why we need to figure out how to knock that barrier down a little bit because bringing that talent in Mm -hmm. is, is a, is a better positive feedback loop for the mentors as well. That too. Absolutely. And uh, I'm thrilled to see it happening. I, I'd love to be able to call out more businesses that are that are directly proactively involved because I know there are. I'm aware because of a relationship I have with one in particular, D'Angelo Marine Exhaust. They have spent a lot of time and energy this past summer with their apprenticeship programs, bringing in uh, students from schools, giving them tours of the facility to kind of set the hook, let these kids see what they're doing and see yeah. that there's a career path you know, that's not academic, getting your master's degree in some obscure discipline, but, you know, those many students that are not taking that career path, that they're not, that's not the direction to go in their life. Yeah. And I think that's kind of been an argument in our probably country in general. Yes. It was that really strong focus on college and higher education to the detriment of other tradesmen. Yeah. And so we've lost, there's so much knowledge that's just going to be disappearing as people retire. That's, and, that's, we, that's we what's happening. and we don't have I, those apprenticeships. Like yeah, you were I, saying, I've, I've been watching that happen. Mm-hmm. I've been watching people that I hired many you know, 20, 30 years ago that after 25 plus years are leaving my previous company, which is amazing to think you retain employees yeah. that long, but you know, there's no, there's not a big labor pool coming in behind that to fill back that in. Yeah, I, I, I speak a, for a living. Go figure that. <laughs> but no, so I, I, I applaud this apprenticeship program. I, I hope it expands throughout the industry and throughout the country. That's what we need. And, it is. you know, if more of us have this voice to say, make it happen, let's support it, let's help it happen. It's a win for everybody. It's, it's an investment in our future, for sure. I would think, yeah, I definitely agree with that yeah so wendy you are uh, you're moving in some cool directions i i'm excited to see it what's next for you any thoughts about what you, you know, might want to be doing in the future besides making yeah you know this sunburst yacht charter is massively successful on the west coast i hope so i've poured blood sweat and tears, tears in three, literally sure. all three yeah yeah um yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, don't currently have any busted knuckles, but yes. Uh, yeah, it's our industry is so fluid. So to have been with a program for as long as I have is a rarity. Yeah. It's also a bit of a blessing. I've had a chance to learn a lot. I've worked my way up from just a boat captain to um captain that is mentoring another staff captain to a director of marine operations who oversees anything that has to do with boats or water or people yeah and so my progression has been fulfilled i never know where this industry is going to take me next because like i said everything it's just been a string of happy accidents including my position here happy accidents accidental success exactly. however you want to look at that right yeah because i started with this program in the middle of the pandemic yeah go figure. So. <laughs> changes yeah so i honestly i don't know what is next my life is very intertwined with this program right now but it is the yachting industry yeah. and the owners could wake up tomorrow and decide that this is no it's longer no something yeah it's right. no longer fun right. and then your job evaporates yeah. so it's a reality check and that's it is. you know it is, and it is but part of another industry. reason why you're working towards your 500 or 1600 ton ticket. Yeah, and definitely. That opens always, a lot of doors for you, and always moving on, always yeah, moving up. Yeah, and you know, I think it's. I think people who are going to watch this show will see a remarkable young lady who has got a pretty good head on her shoulders. Thank you. That's figured it out, and I, that's what I like about this conversation. I really think you figured it out pretty well, and I think you bring something real to the table. It's thank just you. made this an absolute delight. Um, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I can't thank you enough for joining the show and uh, part of the conversation. And I hope that you're going to inspire some people to go, wow, look what Wendy did. You know, I, I think I want to do something like that. 
Well, I am always available for emails and text chats and things like that. There's a handful of people that have contacted me through LinkedIn. I have a friend who used to run a maritime school. So some of his students contact me. So I'm doing what I can. My focus is always the crew that's in front of me and making sure that, that they get their attention and their training and all of that. But well, if anybody wants to reach out to Wendy, they can also go through Yachting International Radio. Yep. We can get you guys in touch. But until we have the luxury and, and the privilege of sitting together again and uh, enjoying another conversation, Wendy, I just have to thank you for joining Yachting USA. It's people like you that are making us wildly successful, and I'm very grateful. Well, thank you for having me. It's a uh, Nice to be part of the Yachting International Radio family. So You are. I appreciate it. Darlin, thanks so much. Thank you. We will see you again. And until the next time, I'm out of here.